So uh, welcome everyone. Um, so we have attendees joining the joining the call. So we'll uh, we'll just wait for a couple of minutes for people to to join the call. Okay, so uh, seems like we have a popular call today. We're already over 50 attendees. So, okay, so just a couple of couple of call notes before we before we uh, kick off. So, questions you can ask questions via the Q and A button, which is at the bottom of your your screen. Um, so you can you can post questions while while the talk is happening, um, but uh, we'll probably ta we'll have a, a, an extended Q and A session at the end of the talk. We hope so. Probably would like to store most questions for the end of the talk. So, but do indicate that if you would prefer your talk your question to be answered during the talk. Okay. So I think we're it's now two minutes past the hour, so we should probably get get kicked off. So my name is Jerome Breen. I'm chairing this call today. Um, it's my pleasure to um, host uh, Elliot Tucker Drop, who is an associate professor in psychology and psychiatry at the University of Austin, specializing in quantitative methods. Um, as you can see here, he's working on quantitative methods that are, are distinctly useful to a lot of the work that we do. And uh, I recently saw Elliot present at the BGA conference and these methods are really interesting because they allow us to carry out uh, analyses that haven't really been possible to date in, in GWALS. So anyway, with that, I'll uh, hand, over to, hand over to Elliot to introduce his talk. Great, thanks so much, Jerome. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, be here and um, I'm grateful for the invitation. Uh, so, um, uh, I'll be talking about genomic structural equation modeling today. Uh, this is a new method that I developed with the team of researchers that's listed here. You can uh, uh, see that uh, two researchers in particular are highlighted, um, and uh, those are Andrew Gratzinger and Michel Nivard, and they have been absolutely instrumental in everything that I'm going to present today. Um, Andrew is a uh, graduate student uh, with me here at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, uh, Michel Nivard is a researcher at uh, VU in Amsterdam. And I believe that uh, hopefully Andrew is tuning in uh, from Amsterdam. He's visiting Michel right now. So uh, with that said, um, I'll get started uh, with the presentation. So this is a, um, uh, uh, these are key findings from a paper that was recently published. It's been on Bio Archive for a good amount of time now. And I think that um, people are generally familiar with uh, the sort of pattern that's presented here, which is that statistical pleiotropy for uh, complex traits is pervasive. Uh, genetic correlations can be found almost everywhere you look. Um, and in my view, what this sort of um, pattern uh, really necessitates is methods for analyzing joint genetic architecture amongst constellations of traits. Um, just to orient you, on the left are genetic correlations amongst psychiatric phenotypes. These are uh, estimated using LD score regression. On the right are uh, genetic correlations between uh, both psychiatric and uh, other brain phenotypes and a, a host of quantitative traits, uh, such as educational attainment, intelligence, personality. Um, and you can see that there are um, uh, correlations um, all over. So if we have one of these genetic atlases, as they come to be called, um, what do we do with them? So I would argue that genetic correlations are uh, data to be modeled, not simply results by themselves. So we can ask questions such as what data generating process gave rise to the correlations? Are some more plausible than others? 
uh, can a high dimensional matrix of genetic correlations amongst phenotypes be closely approximated with a low dimensional representation? And then finally, how can these resulting models be incorporated into multivariate discovery? So uh, this method that we've developed, genomic structural equation modeling, is um, currently um, up as a preprint on BioArchive, and uh, we have uh, functioning software that can also be found um, uh, uh, in a link provided on that BioArchive uh, manuscript. Um, there's a wiki with examples, and um, the software is um, free, open source, and self-contained in R. And um, with this, uh, genomic SEM method does is it is a flexible method for modeling ge uh, joint genetic architecture of many different traits. It only requires conventional GWAS summary statistics. It accommodates varying and unknown amounts of sample overlap amongst the contributing samples. Um, it can incorporate joint genetic architecture, architecture into GWAS to aid in multivariate discovery. Um, and as part of that, it includes a locus-specific diagnostic test for heterogeneity that we call Q, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, to identify variants that operate through more specialized pathways than those that are implied by the genome-wide covariance structure. Um, and uh, finally, uh, I'll give a little bit of a peek at the end of this talk about how we can use uh, this framework to formalize Mendelian randomization along, uh, across large constellations of SNPs and phenotypes. And that's something that we're actively working on, but um, uh, is already able to be implemented in the software that um, uh, can be downloaded today. Um, so a little bit of a primer. So genomic structural equation modeling um, uh, follows from a long tradition of structural equation modeling outside of uh, genetics. Um, and so for those of you not familiar with how structural equation modeling works, I'm gonna give it a little bit of an overview. Um, I think that a more intuitive uh, uh, name than structural equation modeling would perhaps be structured covariance modeling because uh, the entire purpose of the uh, method is to structure an observed covariance matrix um, in, in a way that is implied by a model. And I'll talk a little bit more about that next. So imagine, and we don't know this in, uh, in practice, but imagine that we knew the generating causal process that underlied our data. So for instance, perhaps we uh, knew that X caused Y uh, with an effect size of 0.4. Um, and Y caused Z with an effect size of 0.6. Just for the sake of simplicity, I've, for simplicity, I've uh, uh, scaled these uh, variables to have unit variances. Um, if so if we knew that, that generating causal process and we knew the magnitude of the effects, we would know exactly what covariance amongst the three uh, variables to expect in the population. So uh, we would expect to see a covariance between X and Y, in this example, 0.4, between Y and Z uh, of 0.6. And we would also expect to see a covariance between X and Z of 0.24 by virtue of the fact that um, X has an association with with Z by way of its pathway through Y. So in practice, we don't know what the generating causal process is, and we certainly don't know the effect sizes. Um, and, and instead, what we observe is sample data, and we propose a model. So in this case, on the left, you can see that we have a fictitious observed covariance matrix obtained from a sample, and it's an approximation of a population covariance matrix that exists in um, in theory, but we're not able to directly observe. So what we can do then is we can propose a model. In this case, I'm proposing the model that happens to be the true model, um, but this isn't always the case because we don't know what the true model is. And what we then do is we estimate parameters from the data and evaluate fit of the model relative to the data. So in this case, the structure of the model is the same as that it, it, uh, that generated the data, but the effect sizes are unknown. So we have these labeled um, uh, with symbols rather than with um, uh, values. And what you can see here is that there are five unknowns in this particular model. There's one, two, three variances, and two regressions. But in the 
raw data, what we have are six unique pieces of information. We have three variances and three covariances. So in this particular case, we have a model that is a simplification of the dimensionality of the data. It has one degree of freedom because it's only estimating five free uh, parameters in spite of the fact that there are up to six that can be estimated. So when we evaluate the fit of this model to the data and we estimate the parameters that minimize the discrepancy between the model implied covariances and the observed covariances, we get this. So these are our model parameter estimates. They're not exactly what they were in the true generating data. Um, and that's in this case because of sampling variability. This is a simulation. Um, and what we can see is that the model implied covariance matrix looks close, but not exactly like the observed covariance matrix. So that's one example of how structural equation modeling works to um, <clears throat> simplify the dimensionality of a uh, higher dimensional observed uh, set of covariances. In this case, it's not all that much of a simplification because we're only saving one degree of freedom. Um, importantly, we don't need to just estimate regression relations um, uh, between variables that we've observed in our data. We can also stipulate models in which the uh, regression relations involve unobserved factors. So in this case, we have uh, five measured outcomes, Y1 through Y5. Uh, we can observe covariances amongst all of them. Um, and we can propose a model in which we say that the reason that these five phenotypes are correlated is by virtue of the fact that they're all caused by an unobserved uh, variable, which we're calling F. These um, path diagrams, I think, are uh, intuitive, and I like to use them. But it's important to keep in mind that they um, uh, have a direct uh, set of um, mappings to uh, systems of uh, simultaneous uh, regression equations. So in this case, uh, each y, so y1 through yk, is a function of a factor loading lambda times the factor plus a uh, phenotype-specific uniqueness. So when we uh, uh, specify these equations simultaneously and we estimate the parameters from the data that fit, that uh, produce the um, best fit to the data in terms of minimizing the discrepancy between the model implied covariances and the observed covariances, um, we uh, obtain our solution. Um, I'm not going to provide numeric solutions for all of these uh, uh, ideas here, but I'm just giving a general sense of things. We can do similar things where we specify two unknown fact, uh, two unobserved factors, and we can estimate a regression relation between them. So this is quite uh, a flexible framework, and the um, form of the structured covariance model really depends on how the user chooses to specify it. And of course, multiple models can be specified, and their fits can be compared to one another. So genomic structural equation modeling uses these same principles that structural equation modeling outside of genetics has been using for a great while. Um, and what it does is it, it models uh, genetic covariance matrices that are derived from GWAS summary statistics using a two-stage estimation method. So in this next section, I'll talk a little bit about the estimation method. So in stage one, we use um, LD score regression uh, to estimate genetic covariances between um, all of the uh, phenotypes that we um, are interested in modeling. Um, our software package uses a, a, an expanded uh, version of LD score regression, which allows us to estimate the genetic covariances for a host of different phenotypes, not just one or two uh, simultaneously. And this is important because it allows us to estimate the dependencies among sampling errors, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But this first matrix that we produce is what is generally thought of as a genetic atlas. It is a matrix of uh, genetic covariances. So it's similar to a genetic correlation matrix, but on the diagonal, rather than uh, having ones, it has the heritabilities. And on the off diagonal, it uh, rescales the genetic correlations relative to the heritabilities of the constituent phenotypes. So uh, these are co-heritabilities on the off diagonal. The second matrix that's estimated using this multivariable version of uh, LD square regression is a matrix that we call V. 
And this is the matrix that matrix that uh, contains information about the precision of the estimates in our genetic atlas. So on the diagonal of this matrix, we have the squared standard errors of all of the um, uh, heritability and genetic covariance estimates. And on the off diagonal uh, portion of this V matrix, we have the dependencies between estimation errors that are um, uh, uh, that occur as a function of uh, sample overlap between contributing uh, uh, GWAS summary statistics. And this is important because this is what allows us to um, uh, model data that's contributed from uh, a, a number of different sources that may or may not overlap to some, no, or all uh, to, uh, uh, to all, uh, the full extent. Um, and the way that these off-diagonal elements are populated is through the same jackknifing approach that's used in the original LD score regression method, um, but the jackknifing is used not just to estimate um, uh, standard errors, but it's estimated to, uh, 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 adapted to estimate those dependencies between standard errors. In stage two estimation, what we do is we use these S and B matrices um, as our starting point, and we apply a uh, structural equation model, model that we specify as the user uh, to, the, uh, to those matrices. So uh, the model that we propose is um, a decision on the part of the particular user. There are some uh, models that are probably going to be um, used more often than others, but the range is um, uh, nearly limitless. Um, and the basic idea here is that the uh, structural equation model it implies a genetic covariance matrix, sigma, which is a function of a set of model parameters, which we label theta. And um, we estimate the parameters theta that minimize the discrepancy between that model implied genetic covariance matrix sigma and the S matrix that we produce under stage one. And that discrepancy is a weighted function that is, uh, uh, can be seen here. So we're minimizing this fit function um, where the uh, weight is the inverse of the diagonal of the um, V matrix. So this is um, a, weight, a weighting function that is uh, basically uh, uh, the uh, inverse of the uh, uh, squared standard errors. Um, and that allows us to uh, find a model that minimizes this weighted fit, fit function and obtain unique parameter estimates um, uh, that satisfy that condition. And then the standard errors of those parameter estimates are obtained using a sandwich correction that uh, relies on the full V matrix that includes the off diagonal elements. And the reason that we uh, only weight by the diagonal but then uh, obtain standard errors using the off diagonals is that um, uh, weighting by the, the full matrix uh, during the fit process can lead to computational problems and to um, uh, uh, mo uh, models that, uh, that for which the fit can't be easily obtained. So this is a much more computationally uh, efficient and pragmatic estimator, but it still uses those off diagonals in order to obtain the correct standard errors of the um, model parameters. We then derive model fit statistics, such as AIC and model chi-square that we can use to evaluate fit of competing models uh, relative to one another and evaluate the fit of the models relative to the original observed uh, genetic covariances. So let me give an example here. Um, so in this example, uh, what we actually sought to do is reproduce findings that were obtained using another method. So this is a method called genome-wide inferred summary statistics. This is a really cool method that uh, Michel Nivard uh, 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 developed uh, a few years ago. And what this method does is it uses summary statistics for uh, contributing uh, sets of discovery phenotypes to produce new sets of summary statistics for phenotypes that hadn't actually been GWAS. Um, and in some cases, it's not even possible to GWAS them. So uh, in the example from that original paper, what they did is they produced summary statistics for um, a GWAS of schizophrenia that partialed the summary statistics uh, from those of bipolar disorders, so that they could examine the genetic variants related to schizophrenia that were not relevant for bipolar disorder. And then they did the same thing where they partialed schizophrenia from bipolar and they examined the associations between 
each of these new derived summary statistics in educational attainment. So what we did is we read in the exact same summary statistics that uh, uh, the authors originally used for GWIS. And instead of creating new summary statistics, uh, what we did is we specified a model in which schizophrenia and bipolar uh, disorder genetics, I should say the genetic components of them, were uh, specified as simultaneous predictors of educational attainment so that we could examine the effects of schizophrenia and educational attainment unique of bipolar and of bipolar on educational attainment unique of schizophrenia. There's the path diagram that represents this uh, uh, linear regression, but we can also see that this is, uh, it, we can also just specify it as a, um, uh, a, a, an equation um, that's linear in the parameters. And so what you can, you can see here is that our finding is very similar to that which was originally reported using GWIS, which is that uh, bipolar genetics are related to educational attainment above and beyond schizophrenia, but schizophrenia is not related to educational attainment above and beyond bipolar. In this next example, we use um, anthropometric, uh, uh, sub summary statistics for anthropometric traits uh, obtained from the Egg and Giant Consortia. Uh, to uh, examine the um, factor structure of uh, a, a number of uh, measurements of height and weight taken in um, uh, both childhood and adulthood. And what you can see on the left is the heat map of these genetic correlations. Uh, this is a nine by nine matrix. Um, it uh, ha has a number of unique elements in it. Um, but what you can see because of the way that these variables have been ordered, what really stands out is that there's two clusters of, uh, of uh, phenotypes. There's this cluster in the upper left and the cluster in the lower right that are highly genetically correlated, uh, where the phenotypes are highly genetically correlated uh, among one another, but not very strongly genetically correlated with phenotypes from the other cluster. So what we did is we specified a structural equation model in which there were two factors, one which we label overweight and the other, which we label early life growth. growth. And uh, we estimated uh, the parameters for this model from the data. And what we found is that uh, the model fit the data well. These are some fit statistics that people familiar with structural equation modeling can see uh, are fairly uh, uh, good in terms of the fit. This is a model with 25 degrees of freedom. So it's simpler than the original uh, S matrix. Um, uh, and that also means that it's uh, falsifiable. Um, and what we can see is that the uh, individual pheno, uh, components of the, the genetic components of the individual phenotypes that load on the overweight factor have fairly high loadings. Those that load on the early life growth factor also have moderate to high loadings, but the two factors are not particularly strongly correlated with one another. And we can use this model to produce a, mal a model implied genetic covariance matrix, in this case, genetic correlation matrix, because I've rescaled it. And what you can see is that it looks very similar to the original one, uh, but it's not identical. It's losing a bit of nuance, but it's really capturing the major features. Now, if we wanted to expand the complexity of our model, we could um, uh, capture uh, more nuance, but at the expense of parsimony. Um, uh, I would argue that um, this model is, uh, uh, it, it is, is quite useful in, in terms of, its, of, of how simple it is. Um, and I think this reminds me of one of my favorite quotes by George Fox, which is that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So uh, this really demonstrates that in my opinion. Okay, so um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is how we can incorporate genetic covariance structure in the way that I've already uh, demonstrated, um, how we can incorporate these models of genetic covariance structure into multivariate GWAS discovery. So the first thing that we do is we incorporate SNPs or SNP effects into our S and B matrices. So what we do is we expand the S matrix to include covariances between the SNP and each phenotype that we're examining. And these covariances are obtained directly from the betas and the summary statistics. And they're simply rescaled relative to uh, the minor allele frequencies that are obtained uh, from uh, reference panel data in order to uh, convert them into covariances. And uh, what we also do is we append a segment uh, to the V matrix that includes information about the precision of those SNP effects 
which is the squared standard uh, errors of the SNP covariances on SNP phenotype covariances on the diagonal, and then the dependencies amongst the estimation errors on the off diagonal. And in this case, these dependencies come from the um, uh, cross trait LD score regression intercepts, which are estimates of the uh, phenotypic correlation between the traits being analyzed scaled relative to the amount of sample overlap. And it turns out that that, um, that term is um, exactly what we need in order to obtain an accurate estimate of the dependencies between estimation errors of individual SNP effects on different phenotypes. So we expand these S and B matrices, and then we fit models that include uh, SNP effects to uh, the data. And I'll mention here that in this particular case, we're creating as many S and V matrices as we have SNPs in our data set. And so a different model is fit, or it's the same model, but with different SNPs. It's fit for every single SNP that we're conducting our GWAS on. Uh, at, later on in this talk, I'll talk about uh, ways that we can incorporate multiple SNPs into these models. But in this case, we're taking the, uh, in some ways, massively univariate approach by keeping it uh, uh, at one SNP. Uh, per model, but of course, multivariate in terms of the number of outcomes that we're modeling simultaneously. So for an example of how we do this, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, cross psychiatric disorder GWAS discovery. Um, as some background here, I'm sure many of you are uh, quite interested in this topic and you're very familiar with this background, but I'll give a very brief overview. Um, here's a paper by uh, uh, Jordan Smuller and colleagues uh, that came out fairly recently. Um, this is uh, a paper that talks about the structure of psychopathology in the context of psychiatric genetics. On the left here are uh, genetic correlation matrices. The lower triangle of this matrix is estimated using twin methods. There are a lot of NAs because there have not been twin studies that have examined uh, genetic correlations between uh, rare disorders. And on the upper uh, triangle, we can see the um, uh, genetic correlations estimated from uh, GWAS-derived uh, summary statistics. And what we can see here is that the genetic correlations in uh, very many cases depart substantially from zero. In many cases, they're quite positive. Um, so these authors wrote, heritable influences on psychopathology transcends diagnostic boundaries. As many have noted, our genes don't seem to, read, to have read the DSM. They also write, any given psychiatric disorder will share some genetic risk factors with others. Here's a, a, a nice snippet of text from uh, uh, the paper that I started off uh, talking uh, about uh, in this talk. And so they write, the high degree of genetic correlation among many of the psychiatric disorders adds further evidence that their, their current clinical boundaries do not reflect distinct underlying pathogenic processes, at least on the genetic level. This suggests the deeply interconnected nature for psychiatric disorders. Genetically informed analyses may provide important scaffolding to support such restructuring of psychiatric nosology. So as a starting point here, I'm going to talk about um, general liability uh, for uh, uh, psychiatric uh, disorders that, uh, uh, so I'm going to talk about liability for um, that is non-specific to a single uh, disorder, but is general across many disorders. This is what um, Caspi and Moffat have called the P factor. Um, uh, in their more, most recent paper, they talk about mental disorders in one dimension. Uh, there are some uh, several other researchers who have uh, found this sort of pattern as well and have modeled it with factor analyses. Um, the one thing that I'll mention here is um, I don't believe that there is simply one dimension to psychopathology, but as an example of how genomic structural equation modeling works, I'm going to work based on this simplifying model um, uh, because of its intuitive appeal. Um, uh, Michelle Nivard and Andrew Gratzinger and I are actually in the process of uh, putting together um, summary statistics for a much wider variety of psychiatric disorders than I'm going to present here um, uh, in, uh, in this talk. And we're very interested in examining uh, more nuanced uh, aspects of factor structure. So uh, some of you who are watching may be approached by us uh, in the near future uh, about a collaboration on that. So on the left here is a genetic correlation matrix um, for five case control phenotypes. 
So there's schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, PTSD, and anxiety. You can see that these are um, uh, moderately to strongly uh, genetically correlated with one another. What we did is we uh, estimated a factor model in which we specified one common factor that underlined, underlied the covariation amongst the different, uh, the genetic covariation amongst the, these different case control phenotypes. And of course, because this covariation isn't perfect, there are also unique factors, these residuals down here, that represent unique variation that is specific to the individual phenotypes. Um, what we then did is we expanded this matrix to include SNP effects. This is just one example uh, for one particular SNP that we um, uh, fit the, the model to. So we can see that this uh, column over here now includes the SNP effects on the factor. This particular SNP has negative associations with um, uh, four of the five uh, uh, case control phenotypes, and uh, it has a pretty much a a, a null association with PTSD, um, which happens to be the phenotype that has the lowest um, uh, association with that general factor in, our, in the model that I just showed. Um, what I'll also show in a moment is, way, is a way that we can index whether or not this departure, for instance, for PTSD is significant enough to warrant um, excluding the SNP at, in terms of having a, an effect at a very general level. Um, here's the model that includes the SNP. So we have the SNP predicting the, uh, the factor. We can see, I believe this was one of our genome-wide significant hits. Um, and we can see that we've now estimated a SNP effect with one parameter that uh, summarizes it, its associations with all five phenotypes. And what I think is particularly nice here is that we fit this model to univariate summary statistics from different case control GWASs. We didn't need to do anything special in terms of obtaining the summary data, but we were still able to integrate the, um, uh, the, the results across the different GWASs in order to fit a multivariate model. Here's a Manhattan plot um, that shows our discoveries. So what you can see here is um, uh, there are 128 uh, approximately independent lead SNPs in total. 27 of these, and those are in the black triangles, are SNPs that, are, that were not previously identified in any of the five contributing uh, genome-wide association studies. So they were not genome-wide significant, and they were not in uh, LD with uh, SNPs that were genome-wide significant in the univariate summary statistics that went into this model. We can also see that there were 41 previously significant uh, uh, hits that were no longer significant in this model. So they were significant for at least one of the uh, univariate summary statistics, one of the case control traits. But when we modeled uh, the data in a multivariate fashion, they were no longer genome-wide significant. And this is to be expected. This isn't because they were false discoveries per se, but it uh, is likely uh, going to be the case that when we have variants that, are, that, that operate through more specialized pathways rather than domain general pathways, when we include them in a multivariate model that uh, examines associations with general dimensions of liability, those SNPs will uh, actually lose significance. And finally, we have one significant SNP, which we call a, a, a Q-SNP uh, hit. This is genome-wide significant. It's uh, uh, over here. This is its effect size on P and the, I'm not showing it, but there's a Manhattan plot of the significance of the heterogeneity statistic. And this is a SNP for which um, there is very strong evidence that it does not operate on a general dimension of liability, but actually has heterogeneous effects uh, that differ across the different uh, case control phenotypes. Uh, here's a heat map of the unique hits that weren't previously reported. Um, what you can see is that each horizontal bar represents the, um, associate, the association between the SNP and um, each of the five case control phenotypes. They're generally consistent in color because uh, SNPs uh, that are operating on this general dimension of uh, cross-trait liability are going to have con consistent effects across the different individual uh, disorders. Um, uh, as uh, some initial validation of uh, our discoveries. Uh, what we did is we cross-referenced these discoveries with um, 
those made in other uh, uh, GWASs that did not contribute to our um, uh, contribute uh, to these particular analyses. And we found, I believe, that there were five uh, of the hits that were previously reported um, to be either genome-wide significant or suggestive of, uh, of uh, an effect. So I believe it was P less than uh, 10 to the negative uh, fifth for, um, uh, from these other uh, studies. So this SNP uh, has been reported in three, as, uh, 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 in three other studies for schizophrenia and neuroticism. Uh, this one for schizophrenia in two studies. There's one for MDD. Uh, there's one from the cross disorder analysis and for bipolar. There's one for schizophrenia. Um, just as a sanity check, we uh, ran our results through um, uh, DEPICT and we found that our hits were enriched in the nervous system as we would expect. Um, so this, this estimated heterogeneity, which we're calling QSNF, is what I want to talk about next. And what this does is it's a, a test statistic that uh, indexes the extent to which a model that assumes that the SNP has an effect on the general dimension of liability fits worse than a model that allows the SNP to have effects on the individual uh, uh, disorders. And so if it does fit worse, that suggests that the SNP is not necessarily or not actually operating on the general dimension, but instead it's having more heterogeneous effects. This is a chi square distributed test statistic. Here is um, uh, an example of what that looks like. So on the top is a, uh, it is a SNP that had that was genome-wide significant in terms of its hit on the general dimension of liability, and it had a very low heterogeneity uh, statistic. So this is one that um, was operating more uniformly on the general dimension of liability, and you can see that it has consistent effects across all five disorders. And here is the SNP that was uh, sig that was significant in terms of its heterogeneity statistics. So it has strong uh, associations with schizophrenia and bipolar, but fairly null associations, maybe even negative associations, probably null is what I would um, infer here with the other three uh, disorders. Okay, so um, next what we did is we wanted to see how well uh, the summary statistics that we obtained for this new multivariate uh, GWAS, um, uh, meta-analysis uh, performed in out-of-sample prediction. So the first thing we did is we reran the GWAS with summary statistics that did not include data from uh, UK Biobank. So we've turned, obtained a new set of summary statistics that excluded Biobank. And then we predicted into UK Biobank. So we're predicting um, symptom counts, so not case control status, for a range of different um, uh, disorders. And uh, we uh, uh, used factor analysis to obtain a factor that reflected a general dimension that we're calling P of uh, psychiatric symptomology and then more domain specific um, uh, symptoms. And so here are our results. On the left uh, of each cluster is the R squared of the polygenic score for the uh, genomic sum uh, uh, summary statistics for the uh, uh, where we're discovering on what we're calling this P factor, this general dimension of liability. Next to it in lighter brown is the, uh, is the uh, uh, polygenic score that was derived using summary statistics simply from univariate schizophrenia, uh, uh, a univariate schizophrenia GWAS. And what you can see here, and this is what we were expecting on the left here, is that when we're predicting a uh, general dimension of psychiatric symptomology across different uh, uh, disease types that our discoveries made on a general liability factor produce uh, larger out of sample R squared in terms of their polygenic scores than those ob obtained using the univariate uh, GWAS summary statistics. What we were less uh, certain about is whether or not this, this, the polygenic scores that were derived using the general dimension of liability from genomic SEM would perform as well as the univariate um, uh, summary statistics uh, for when predicting uh, symptoms of, 
individual disorders. And in fact, what we found is that in every case, the out of sample R squared was highest when using the general dimension of uh, liability um, uh, as our uh, for our GOS disco uh, discovery uh, for our GOS discovery to form those polygenic scores. So, for instance, psychotic experiences um, was predicted um, better by the general dimension of liability than it was by the uh, polygenic score derived simply from uh, the schizophrenia GWAS, and we see the same sort of thing for the other outcomes. And of course, schizophrenia does perform fairly well because of its high power. Okay, so I'll briefly talk about a, another example that we conducted. We wanted to do an item level analysis of neuroticism. So this was a, an example that we, um, that we chose because we wanted to use data that uh, uh, reflected nearly complete sample overlap. So we're using the item level GWAS summary statistics for each of, I believe, 12 neuroticism items from UK Biobank. Um, what we did is we actually used the summary statistics da downloaded directly from Ben Neal's website. Um, that he produced uh, using the uh, HAIL software. Um, uh, and what we did is we, uh, in order to get the appropriate effect sizes, we needed to have uh, the results in terms of the logistic regression coefficient, because that is uh, most appropriate when predicting binary outcomes, which uh, these items were. Um, but um, the HAIL software was run using a linear probability model, which is technically an incorrectly specified model. Um, but what we did is we uh, converted it to approximate a logistic. And um, for those of you who are interested in doing the same thing, this is automated in our software package using uh, what we call the sum stats argument. So it's very straightforward to do. Um, here is the result uh, of the genetic factor model of neuroticism. What you can see is that the genetic components of each of the individual items uh, load highly on a general factor of neuroticism, but each individual item uh, has a loading that is less than unity, which indicates that any given item is not picking up on uh, the totality of the genetic signal of the latent neuroticism dimension, but is also including some domain specificity or item specificity. Here is the, um, the Manhattan plot. We uh, uh, had 118 approximately independent lead SNPs. 38 of those were not uh, genome-wide significant in the univariate summary statistics that went into this analysis. 60 were previously significant in the univariate summary statistics, but not for the general dimension of neuroticism. So these may be um, more, these SNPs may operate through more specialized pathways than a general factor of neuroticism. And we actually found 69 significant uh, Q-SNP estimates. So 69 um, uh, SNPs for which their effects were uh, uh, uneven across the different neuroticism items. Again, these uh, hits were disproportionately uh, expressed in the nervous system. Uh, here's an example of one lead Q-SNP hit. So this is a um, uh, a SNP that had uneven effects across the different items. And what you can see here is that for these three items, nervous, worry, and tense, these are Z statistics, not effect sizes presented here. Um, they were, uh, th th there was virtually no association. It was slightly negative, but you can see that it was really, uh, the Z statistic was quite low. So um, in spite of the fact that this SNP had uh, very positive associations with the remaining uh, neuroticism items. So this suggests that this SNP does not confer um, risk towards a general neuroticism, but operates through a uh, more specialized pathway. It turns out that the, the SNPs that um, uh, were genome-wide significant for Q, so those that were heterogeneous, were also disproportionately represent, uh, expressed in the nervous system. Um, the last thing we wanted to do on this particular analysis is get an estimate of the overall power that we obtain by doing an item level analysis versus a, uh, an analysis that in some way clumps the data uh, or takes advantage of the fact that the items are uh, genetically correlated with one another. 
So what you can see here in yellow are the chi-square statistics um, expressed as a proportion um, for the individual items. They're expressed as a proportion relative to the lowest powered um, uh, item, so the item with the lowest average chi-square. So what we do is we take the mean chi-square, subtract one, and take the ratio relative to the lowest item. And this gives us an, a, an index of generally what the um, the uh, effective increase in sample size would, would look like in order to obtain the same sort of power for that lowest item, um, lowest powered item. Uh, when we when we create parcels, and parcels are created by clumping four of the individual items together and do, performing the GWAS on the mean of those four items, we obtain somewhat better power than for most of the individual items. When we use genomic SEM and create a factor of those three parcels, we get even higher chi-square. And when we do the perform the genomic SEM on the items themselves, we have a substantial increase of power in power relative to any of the other approaches. So even when there's complete sample overlap, um, and even when um, uh, compared to using other methods of data aggregation, genomic SEM, at least in this example, is um, uh, doing very well in terms of increasing power. Um, one might wonder how uh, genomic SEM relates to other multivariate methods for GWAS discovery. The first thing I'll point out, of course, is that genomic SEM does more than um, uh, aid in discovery. It is also uh, quite useful for modeling uh, joint genetic architecture, um, putting discovery aside. Um, but this is something that uh, I've been asked by a number of people, so um, I'm going to briefly talk about how it relates to MTAG. So MTAG, which uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is um, a multivariate method that incorporates summary statistics for genetically correlated phenotypes in order to boost uh, discovery or boost power uh, for um, a target phenotype. Um, this is the MTAG moment condition. It is an expectation that involves um, uh, the uh, SNP effects for the contributing traits and their genetic uh, correlations. We can rewrite it in terms that at least I'm a little bit more familiar with, do a little bit of rearrangement. And what this MTAG moment condition essentially does is it specifies uh, two sets of equalities, both for the same uh, SNP effect. So the SNP effect estimate is uh, uh, specified to be um, a function of uh, this ratio between the um, uh, SNP effect for uh, well, I, I won't go into the details, but it's, it's specified to be a, a ratio and also an equality uh, to this other term. These uh, are not necessarily going to equal each other. So fit a, a uh, fit statistic or a fit function is used to arbitrate between these and provide an optimal estimate for the uh, MTAG derived beta. And if we specify a model in genomic sim that looks like this, and again, the user chooses to specify the model of his or her um, liking, so that if the user chooses to specify a model that looks like this, this is in the case of, a, uh, of two phenotypes, but it can be expanded to multiple phenotypes. Um, we produce expectations for the model implied uh, genetic covariances and um, uh, phenotype covariances. We rearrange them and we get the exact same equalities that MTAG uh, 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 per, uh, uh, implies. And so uh, it turns out that when genomic SEM is specified in this way, uh, it's equivalent to MTAG. And again, the fit function is used to arbitrate between the two, and the fit functions are actually quite similar in the way that they look. They're um, almost identical. Uh, the genomic SEM fit function includes some extra elements that um, don't just uh, pertain to uh, SNP effects, but also to genetic variances and covariances. In, uh, in a simulation, what we did is we um, uh, simulated data where we uh, knew what the um, uh, true effect sizes were of the individual SNPs. We um, allowed for some uh, uh, sample overlap, but not an overwhelming amount of sample overlap. And then we ran um, uh, the data through MTAG and through um, what, we're, or what we've called here classic MTAG and through a uh, genomic SEM model that was meant to approximate MTAG or to be equal to MTAG. And what you can see is that for both the betas and the Z statistics, 
the correlation between um, uh, the result obtained from classic MTAG and genomic SEMS version of MTAG uh, is greater than 0.99. The slope of the function is essentially one and the intercept is zero. So we are really reproducing uh, exactly what MTAG does. And of course, this is only because we've chosen to specify a model that produces the same expectations of, of MTAG. And that may not always be the most appropriate model depending on uh, the, the data and the situation. So um, genomic SEM, of course, will allow the user to specify from a, a, a near limitless array of, of models uh, based on the particular setting. Okay, so the last thing that I wanna do is just give a bit of a peek at some ongoing work that we're doing using genomic SEM. This is work that is uh, headed by Michelle Nivard, um, and it's, uh, we're very excited about it, and I'm just gonna give um, a hint of what we're doing. Um, um, but as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, that this is already technically able to be accomplished using the software that is available, but we are um, uh, performing simulations and, um, uh, and whatnot to really get a, a handle on how this method performs under a variety of different conditions. So um, the, the empirical example involves the association between ADHD, educational attainment, and income. So the, the research question is, are the socioeconomic sequelae of ADHD mediated by educational attainment? And this is uh, potentially relevant because if it's true, then staying in school may become a treatment goal for ADHD. So what we could do um, is we could just fit a genetic mediation model. So we could specify educational attainment as a mediator of the association between ADHD and income. And we would find that there's a, a substantial amount of mediation indicating that perhaps ADHD uh, or genetic disposition towards ADHD uh, is, uh, has an effect on, uh, on earnings by way of reducing the amount of years of education. But of course, this is only one possible model that we could apply to the data. We could uh, specify a model that looks very similar, but actually has very different implications. And in this situation, uh, the model indicates that ADHD has an effect, or genetic disposition towards ADHD has an effect on educational attainment. It also has an effect on income. And there are, uh, a, there's a genetic correlation between educational attainment and income that is uh, not causal. So how do we arbitrate between these different possible scenarios? Um, one way to do this is to rely on the principles of Mendelian randomization. So as I've already shown, genomic SEM models genetic covariant structure, and it also allows for incorporation of SNPs into the model. And so we can combine these features to perform Mendelian randomization um, in multivariate space. So to give you an idea of how Mendelian randomization looks in a, uh, in a simple situation, what we have is a, a SNP here on the left, which is uh, our instrumental variable. We have two heritable phenotypes, Y1 and Y2. And we specify that the SNP has an effect on Y1, but it doesn't have an, a direct effect on Y2. This is what's called the exclusion restriction. And if this is a tenable assumption, then what we can do is we can identify a model that has two additional pathways. It has a pathway between Y1 and Y2 that is putatively causal, and it has an additional pathway that represents residual confounding, perhaps due to pleiotropy from other variants not um, put into this model. So we can expand that to include multiple phenotypes and multiple SNPs. So in this case, we have um, eight genome-wide significant hits for educational attainment that we've sampled from the larger body of hits from the ACPE EA2 paper. We have four uh, hits for ADHD that we um, uh, sampled uh, from uh, 11. So we chose the four that were um, overlapping, uh, that had overlapping um, uh, SNPs genotypes for the different um, summary statistics. And then for income, we're choosing that, uh, we're specifying that as our outcome, so we're not including hits for it. And we fit this model and we're specifying a model in which we're hypothesizing that ADHD may have a, a causal effect on educational attainment, but there may be also some residual confounding between the two. Um, and of course, you can see that we're using multiple traits, not just two. So here's what we get when we fit this model. We see that there is a causal effect 
uh, according to the assumptions of the model of ADHD on educational attainment. Um, but there's also residual genetic confounding. So if we had just fit the mediation model, we would have given um, too much credit to the genetic covariance, uh, to, to causality in terms of interpreting that genetic covariance or that regression relation. But by including these Mendelian instruments, we are able to separate the portion of the association that is causal from that which is residual confounding. We can also, of course, ask whether or not there's mutual causation. Does educational attainment have an effect on ADHD? And we actually find evidence that it does. But it, when specifying this model, we had to allow for um, uh, pleiotropy of the individual Mendelian instruments um, because these uh, there were two SNPs that uh, very clearly had um, direct effects on ADHD that were not mediated through educational attainment. And so we're currently interested in developing some algorithms to um, uh, to identify these these pleiotropic um, uh, SNPs so that we uh, don't leave it simply to the user to intuitively specify them. Um, but what, what, what I will say is that this sort of approach is quite similar and mathematically uh, extremely similar to uh, what's referred to as uh, Heidi outlier analysis. Um, we can extend this Mendelian randomization model further. Um, I'm not going to show results here just because I don't want to run over an hour, but um, we can use genome, uh, gene, gene expression summary data to construct Mendelian instruments for genes rather than individual SNPs. So we can, uh, for instance, use the output from fusion, which uh, imputes gene expression uh, data into uh, 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 based on uh, uh, TWAS, uh, collateral TWAS data. And we can include that uh, those results in our model and treat uh, expressed genes as Mendelian instruments in much the same way that I've just shown with individual SNPs. And it's actually quite straightforward to do using our software. We have a read fusion function that uh, directly reads in those TWAS results. So to conclude here, um, uh, uh, we believe that we can combine genomic stem and Mendelian randomization for building mechanistic network models with uh, uh, plausible causal pathways. Um, uh, we've found that this approach scales up uh, quite well to uh, up to about 75 variables. So that would be, for instance, five traits and 70 SNPs or genes. Um, and uh, there's nothing preventing it from scaling up even further. Um, it's simply a matter of optimizing the code. Um, and uh, we can easily include gene expression or any other sorts of omics into our model. And um, uh, I, I haven't discussed this because this is what we're really working on now, which is um, uh, benchmarking this approach against other best practices in the new lane randomization. So um, I think that I've, I've spent my hour here and um, I'll finish with my acknowledgement slides and um, I'm happy to take any sorts of questions that may come up. Thanks a lot. Okay, that's a superb talk, Elliot. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we have uh, one question, and just for the benefit of time, I'll, I'll ask it on behalf of Andrew McIntosh. Um, what are the main notes of caution when using the genomic SEM approach? Um, so what would you say the main caveats are, uh, Elliot? Well, I think that, that, that the, the biggest one is um, to avoid the temptation to interpret a model that we specify as being the true model that represents the causal processes underlying the data. So just because we specify a model that has arrows pointing from some sets of variables to other sets of variables, doesn't mean that we have confirmed that um, that is the causal process that underlies the data. Now, the model may still be quite useful in summarizing or simplifying the data, but I think that a, a big caution here is uh, to avoid um, over-interpreting uh, uh, the results and, and the parameter estimates um, based on the model that we've chosen based on our own uh, predilections. So that's, a, that's I think, a big one. Um, I think that it's also important to um, uh, take some time to uh, really understand how these models work and where the um, information that is informing the parameter estimates is coming from. Um, I think that because these models can often be specified or specified or represented as um, visual diagrams, that there's this uh, this intuitive idea that um, anyone can use them, and um, uh, and and as as long as you can draw the picture, you can produce 
the uh, results and have meaningful scientific findings. But uh, as I think I mentioned earlier, I mean, these, these diagrams correspond to systems of equations. And I think it's important to be cognizant of the fact that we're, we're building models that are based on um, uh, linear equations. And um, we need to be cognizant of that in the same way that we're cognizant of how linear regression models work. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, don't, okay, so we've got another question in the, in the chat. So um, could you comment on how the power of individual discovery G was influences interpretation, particularly in models, for instance, for deriving the P factor? Absolutely. Um, so this is an important point. Um, so if we have GWASs that are contributing to our multivariate um, model that are really um, different in terms of uh, the power that they're, or the discovery sample size that um, uh, they're based on, then um, there is this possibility that we're going to have 